This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. My name is Margaret Chesney. I direct the UCSF Osher Center. We're thrilled to have you join us. I want to just give you a little bit of introduction of what's the thinking behind the course. Some males and females feel a great deal of pressure, or social pressure, to achieve in multiple domains in our lives. And here are just a few. And the, I'm just going to highlight a few of these domains. There are many more. One is family. And within family, we, many of us care for children, not just when they're tiny, though as you become a grandparent like me, then you're back doing that again, um, but also as young people age. And some of you have um, older, quote, children. They're still children, and you still worry about them. They're always there on your mind. So this is one of the domains in which um, we are focused, and we want to do our very best in that domain. And then we add to that our partners. Um, and you know th that can always, as you know, um, partners can be challenging in so many ways. But for some people, it's been particularly challenging, as families have been torn apart these, you know, these last many years. Um, in addition to family, there's home. And in home, there are so many dimensions to the home space. Uh, of course, there's food. For some of us, there's a challenge to find the time to shop, to go. And then, of course, there's how the, we're all supposed to be cooking these very healthy, you know, from scratch, healthy meals every day. That can be another challenge. And then you add to that um, home repairs, to say nothing about furniture, cleaning, lawns, all that stuff. So even if you can have people help you do it, who is the, usually the person that coordinates a lot of that kind of care? If it tends to be you, maybe you raise your hand. Do you coordinate some of the home type things? Those of you who have someone else to do that, tell me afterwards how you do that. So these are just some of our worlds. Then there's the world of work. And I mean when I talk about work, not just work outside the home, but work inside the home. And then the work outside the home is not just paid work, but there's also a lot of unpaid work. But there's work in shops. There's also work in offices. And as I mentioned, there's work at home. A lot of us have home offices, and there's trying to make ends meet, keeping track of everything. Uh, keeping track sometimes of people for whom we're caregivers, uh, paying bills and taxes. All of that is the home, the work domain that many of us live in. And then there's an additional domain that some of us may find ourselves in where we're caring for young people, we're concerned about our families, but we're also attending to and caring for people who are at the later stages of their lives in the world of caregiving. And then when you're busy doing all of these domains, there's also people will say, well, you've got to also take care of yourself. And you know that, what does that entail? Well, for many of us, that entails things like exercise, uh, trying to get all the exercise that we need, either in classes, there's yoga, there's working on our muscles, there, uh, making sure we get the walking in so that our bones stay strong, and doing all of that. And then as we get older, I'm over 60, so I exercise, I am clearly convinced is even more important as we age. But we'll hear more about that from some of our teachers. So very important that we get that physical activity. So that's just one way we care for ourselves. And of course, watching what we eat, um, being with our friends, 
so very important that we have the children, the caregiving, the spouses, but that we've also got many dear friends uh, that are very, very important to us. So last, even in this building, I'm, one of my dearest friends was in the hospital um, having a special pump put in. And you know, I was just you know, trying to get my work done at work so I could be there when she you know, came out of the surgery and I was able to make that happen and I felt glad. And, but that shouldn't be something that I had to like schedule. That should have been the thing that was so important for the whole day. Um, but we sometimes have to schedule our friends. Uh, and then there's sleep. You know, remember that we actually have a whole lecture on sleep, women and sleep. It is something that um, most of us do need to do periodically, and we'll hear a little bit about how women compare to other groups in terms of our sleep. So many, many domains for us to focus on. Um, now, the idea behind this course is that there's a great uh, deal of social pressure for us to kind of do it all, and let me share with you what I uh, mean about that, that there's something that I, I've done a lot of research on women, uh, heart disease in particular, and stress. And one thing we found when we did in-depth interviews with women is that in our 24-7 world, particularly with people on television or watching people on television, we encounter women who excel, or are just excelling in each of these domains. And what we noticed with our research is that women would sort of roll it into one. And so they would be watching, you know, Katie Couric on this show or this other star on this show, and they all look so they've got great clothes, they're in style, they look so fit. And so we say, well, I should look like that and I should have a great job like that. And then we take another person who's a really great friend and someone who does all their home cooking. And a lot of women roll that all into one and say, well, I should be able to be that. And we kind of create a model that is actually um, pretty impossible to obtain. And that this is where some people start talking about being the superwoman, that you could have the perfect house, the perfect clothes, the perfect family, the perfect, you know, doing all of these various things, job or volunteer work, and be in great shape, and, you know, look good, you know. Um, you know, not have what I've noticed, you know, it's, it's there, it just suddenly appears. Um, so it, this is, you know, this idea that somehow we can fight all that back and we can have the superwoman syndrome. And the major symptom, if you read the literature on this, is stress because it's not really possible. We have to make choices and we have to think about ourselves. So that's really the notion behind the course is this social pressure on us. And I think there's social pressure on men, too, to be super men. Now, we will explore the pressures behind this in these various classes. We're going to investigate the origins. We're going to talk about the brain tonight, the female brain. So we're sort of really starting with something very important and very basic to this. And then over the course of the six lectures, we'll be building a portfolio for you to be considering. So in the last lectures, we will conclude with scientifically proven strategies to help you achieve a more balanced portfolio for your own self and for your own health and hopefully for the quality of your lives. So that's the plan. Uh, these are the six courses. You've seen all these. I'll just highlight that we'll be hearing about the female brain from a woman who wrote a book about that. She'll talk about that. Balancing social expectations with your own health. That's tonight. Next week, very important, is the pressure on body image. A lot of us have felt some pressure on trying to have, you know, sort of that body image, particularly if you grew up with Barbie doll. No, well, maybe our speaker tonight can talk about that, but very few people are built like that. In fact, they kind of morphed that person. But they, a lot of us see that, and we kind of, you know, don't want to cathect to that. But we'll talk about body image. Don't let the ideal get in the way of real health. So that's next week. Please stay with us. Uh, but tonight, I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Luann um, Brizendine. So she is a neuropsychiatrist who completed her degree in neurobiology at UC Berkeley, across the bay. She graduated from Yale School of Medicine and did her internship and residency at Harvard. So we have Berkeley, Yale, Harvard. But don't get caught up in the superwoman syndrome. Not even as I'm right in the middle of the introduction, we're all going, oh no, you know, oh, where did I go to school? 
So very few women have done that, but this is great because she's our friend. She's here. But that, I just was showing you, that's how we do this. We immediately start, don't do that. Um, she has also served on both the faculties of Harvard, now I'm making it worse again, okay, and University of California, San Francisco. Now at UCSF, yes, uh, Dr. Brizendine pursues active clinical teaching, writing, and research activities, where she founded the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic that's here at UCSF in 1994, and she continues to serve as the clinic's director. Her first book, The Female Brain, is being translated, or ha is being, but has been translated actually in many languages, 30 languages, and its follow-up, the male brain, which she had, she, she wanted to get the first book, which is the prototype, the female brain, and then she moved to the male brain. Guys, I'm just kidding, sorry. Um, the male brain is only 17 languages, but I bet soon it will be 30 languages. She's currently developing programs for prevention of postpartum depression and for maintaining optimal health and resilience, one of my favorite words, in the perimenopausal and postmenopausal female body and brain. As I mentioned, she's a practicing clinician, a best-selling author, a public speaker, which you will sense tonight, media consultant, endowed professor here at UCSF, an international media co commentator, and she specializes on the emotional, sexual, and social effects of hormones on the brain. So it is a great deal of pleasure, pleasure for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Luann Brizendine. Dying, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret, and thanks for the great staff. It's good to see you all here tonight. So full disclosure of all of this, uh, it does look like from a distance, like the superhero syndrome, <laughs> superwoman syndrome. Um, but I was born in Appalachia, actually, up in the mountains of Kentucky, and my parents were uh, missionaries uh, in uh, 1952. So do the math. I'm very soon to have my 60th birthday. Uh -huh. uh, and I have a son who is back home after having gone to college. Now he's back living at home. So, I, and we have a blended family. Um, my husband has uh, three grandchildren. So I have stepdaughters that are ages 46 and 48, and grandchildren who are nine, um, almost 13, and 15. And then my son is 23. So we have this blended family. And I will tell you that my the oldest stepdaughter is on the phone probably four or five times a week getting advice from her dad about various and sundry kinds of things. So I it, take heart. I mean, the parenting never stops, right? You continue to do that. And my son, of course, is, uh, is back home after having been away for a couple of years. It took us some getting used to. Um, and just getting all those things done, getting the exercise done, getting the getting the, the healthy food. I got lucky, ladies. I have a husband who cooks. <laughs> <laughs> he is a laboratory neuroscientist, and so he likes all of the little organization of food and chopping things up and putting them in things. So it's great. He makes the best salads. I was really I got very lucky. <laughs> so um, that's how that's how some of us do it. <laughs> Um, and I was going to um, spend the time tonight together with you. Some of you may have read The Female Brain. Any of you know The Female Brain book or The Male Brain book? Okay, so you've got a handful. And so I thought for those of you in the audience who hadn't read it, um, I'm going to give you um, enough information here. So the uh, female brain and the male brain, both of those, are going to be what I've based some of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I brought a few copies for anyone who is desperate to have to, to have them af afterwards if you want to come up and get one. I um, am going to give you kind of the cliff note overview, but I didn't start out my career at all um, writing books. And so the way I got interested in the female brain in particular is I can remember raising my hand when I was a medical student after this professor had just given this beautiful talk about um, a study that he'd done in sort of immunological function. Uh, and I raised my hand and I said, well, what did the results in the females show? And he says, oh, oh we don't study the females. The menstrual cycle would just mess up the data. <laughs> 
So, um, but true confession, I felt, here I was, I was about like maybe 23 or 24, I'd done my undergraduate at Berkeley in neuroendocrinology and hormones and behavior. And here I was, and I felt like, oh my gosh, you wouldn't want to mess up your data. <laughs> so you, you get into this really kind of crazy thinking. So that, so years later, I, I kind of, I thought about that as I, as I really got interested in, and to this day, of course, if it hadn't been for Bernadette Healy at the at the NIH in 1992, who f basically made it a rule that you cannot apply for a grant unless you put in there that you're going to study males and females. And you can, even if you're going to only study testicles, you have to put the sentence, we are not studying females because they do not possess testicles. <laughs> <laughs> So they got very serious about it. However, um, I have recently been asking uh, scientists who are giving talks that I attend, um, well, what did the females show if they're doing it in rodents? And they, and they still say, oh, we don't study the females because all the comparison data for years back are only on the males. So if you all get a chance at any point in time and you're hearing someone describe um, scientific studies in, in non-humans, ask them what the data in the females showed. I think we still need to push for that. So at any rate, I'm going to give you the, um, the, the way that this starts from the moment of conception here. So here we are. This is how we all start off. And that is a beautiful high-def picture of the sperm just about ready to enter the egg. If that sperm is carrying an X chromosome, then that fertilized egg will become female. If it's a Y chromosome, it will become male. So from this moment, that, that blob, that egg, will be having the genetic material to eventually become male or female. Now, while we're cooking inside the womb, what happens at eight weeks of fetal life is the tiny testicles in the male start to pump out huge amounts of testosterone that marinates the brain and changes the circuitry into male brain. The female develops unperturbed by testosterone <laughs> so that by the time we're all born, we're either wired to be male or female. And I'm gonna tell you how this kind of plays out um, in our lives health-wise and uh, in specialized ways that we females know. Now, my friend Jill Goldstein at Harvard, if this looks pinkish up at the top, you see that those pink areas, are the areas that are larger in the healthy female brain relative to the size of the brain. And the blue ones that are down deeper here, um, the blue there is larger in the healthy male. Now, a male brain is 11% larger than a female brain, even after you correct for body size. So that's interesting. However, the number of cells, of brain cells, is the same, it's just that in the female, ours are corseted into a smaller skull. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's part of about the body size. So I want to take you a little deeper down here. If you cut off the top of the head and look deep down, you see that big green glob right there. Now that's larger in the male, and that's an area in the hypothalamus called, I thought scientists are clever to call it this, it's called the area for sexual pursuit. <laughs> And it's 2.5 times larger in the human male brain. And that's what all that marinating testosterone did, as an example. Actually, in rodents, in, in rats, it's in the male, it's seven times larger than in the female. So at any rate, there, it's in different species, it's different. But in us, it's 2 to 2.5 times larger. And that's the marination of that testosterone is doing that. Now, if we look a little deeper, I particularly like the uh, shoe and handbag coordination, you know. <laughs> the need for commitment hemisphere, right? <laughs> That's right. And the little footnote, the sex, well, we'll talk about the sex, the sex glob there a little bit later, but down here it says footnote, note how closely connected the small sex cell is to the listening gland. <laughs> Pillow talk, okay. And this is no surprise. <laughs> I like the avoid personal questions at all costs area there up in the front. <laughs> the lame excuses gland. How about dangerous pursuits and the toilet aiming cell if you live in a household of, that's right, et cetera. 
We don't do ironing anymore, but there's a little particle for ironing there. And it says, footnote, the listening to children cry in the middle of the night gland is not shown due to its small and underdeveloped nature, best viewed under a microscope. <laughs> So I show you these because these are the, the kind of funny stereotypes that we have. And stereotypes are, you know, you don't want them to put us in any direction or other or make you do something you can't do. And, you know, 10% of us women do certain things that are considered to be more male, better than they do, and vice versa. But at any rate, there we are. The, the TV, they did this was pri prior to internet days, right? The TV and remote control addiction center. So um, how many of you uh, were coming of age, like, in the decade of the 70s. Anybody in here, 60s and 70s? Okay. So you all may remember what I'm gonna tell you, but I remember living in Ida Sproul dormitory over at UC Berkeley, which is where, it, it, it still, at that time was an all women's only dorm and they had a curfew, you had to be in by 10. But at any rate, I can remember hanging out in the halls with my uh, my peer group, 18, 19 years old, and we would, we would talk about how when we had sons, we were going to raise them to play with like gender neutral toys and they were going to grow up and our future daughters-in-law would thank us for the sensitive husbands we raised for them, right? <laughs> well, that lasted until we had boys of our own. And I can remember give, getting my son uh, some doll or something for Christmas, you know, along with his action figures, but mostly that he rips open the package at Christmas, grabs this doll by her torso, and starts to use her long legs as a spear, going, OK, guys, let's get them. <laughs> was like, instantly, he was using his, uh, his gender-neutral toy for something different. So this was the figure he preferred that year. <laughs> so at any rate, some of you may know Eleanor Maccabee over at, down at Stanford. And she probably now, um, she's retired now, probably in her mid-90s, but she for 40 years um, studied preschool behavior in children and very meticulously did beautiful observational studies with teams of graduate students and looked at all of the playing techniques and styles of boys and girls at age three, four, five. And she would find that little girls would do this type of what she called relationship play. Little boys would do it for about one go round, but girls would sit and say, okay, you be the mommy, I'll be the daddy. Or you be the doctor, I'll be the patient. And they would take the roles and play and switch them quite a bit. Boys would do this a little bit, but they, would pref they preferred something that is referred to as rough and tumble play. Boys in all cultures do this. Even young, especially they've looked at primates, young male animals seem to do much more of this kind of, you know, a, they will do it for longer. Little girls love to chase and run. And I know I was quite a tomboy. I, I preferred to play with the boys in the neighborhood and go catch lizards and snakes and all that kind of stuff. I guess I was a future biologist, but I really, there, so there's a lot of overlap. But I think that one of the things we all know is that behaviorally, <clears throat> We are also encouraged by our culture and our families to take on certain behaviors, to take on certain roles. So the issue of how we get our gender formed, how we get our gender identity formed, is a huge basket of people in my field in, in psychiatry and psychology do lots of work on how that happens. And the consensus at this point is about probably the 50% of it is probably created by our culture and how we grow up. And about the other 50% has to do with our genes and our hormones. So there's some kind of mix in all of us in this room. We've had our own mixture, our own history, and we've come up with our own personal identity and our own personal story to be who we are. Tonight, I'm going to go and talk about some of the particularities of female hormones. Remember I told you about that circuitry in the male brain that gets formed and the circuitry in the female brain that gets formed that's a bit different. And let's be clear, male and female brains are more alike than different. After all, we are the same species. So that said, it's often our hormones that are playing out on that circuitry and that nexus of connections that we have that, that make us um, have some differences. And I'm going to focus, since we're focusing on women's health, 
and I'm particularly interested in women's mental health. I want you to look, you see that big green swath right up here that says the in utero, those trimesters one, two, and three. Now that's where all those hormones are marinating the brain circuits and pumping out from the, the male testicles and making those certain areas larger. Females do not pump out estrogen while we're in utero. We don't do it until one month after birth up to 24 months in this next section. You see where it says birth there? And the big black pump is up there. But from birth till about two years old, little girls, are our ovaries are pumping out huge amounts of estrogen. It's a time that we scientists call infantile puberty. And we actually do not have a clue what it's, what it's really doing. And only in humans and primates, it's not too well studied because it's only in primates and humans. And then little boys will start to have their infantile puberty at about one month to about one year or 14 months old. Their testicles start pumping out, again, huge amounts of testosterone, almost at the adult male levels for both the girls and the boys. We don't know what that's doing. Um, the hypothesis is that it is doing something kind of like finishing school for the hormones of repro the produ reproductive organs and also areas of the brain that are going to put, put, you know, males are put on this planet by Mother Nature to mostly search out fertile females, pursue the female, inseminate them, and carry on with the species. Uh, we females in humans are, per we in this room are the most successful the females are the most successful great 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 granddaughters of the great 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 grandmothers who were successful at keeping helpless infants alive because humans are born at such a very very um, incompetent shall we say state and need 24 hour care for, for quite a while so do you see how that then drops there at about age two years old down to that flat line at the bottom? Boys and girls both make small, small amounts of testosterone and estrogen, about the same as each other during this period that's particular to humans and primates. It's called, anybody know what that's called? The technical name is juvenile pause. We have another common name for it. It's called childhood. <laughs> so that is childhood um, hormonally. And then, of course, you can see the rock and roll that starts at puberty <laughs> as soon as we start turning on. Now, the brain has these really cool cells. Anybody ever look in biology class at, at heart-beating heart cells in a Petri dish? You see them, just they just lay there and they beat. That's what they do, they beat. There's these cells in the hypothalamus in the brain that actually are made to pump, pump, pump out hormones that control your ovaries or your testicles. And during this infant this this childhood, there is another compound that we are just learning about that actually puts on the brakes and doesn't let them pump out those hormones to signal to the testicles or ovaries to pump out anything. That's why it's quiet. So it keep it's the brakes. It keeps everything quiet for a while until you hit puberty and then all of a sudden somehow those brakes are taken off, and those cells go back to pumping out. It's called uh, the GnRH, which is the hormone that tells the pituitary to start squeezing out all that good stuff to go tell the testicle or ovary to make either estrogen or testosterone. OK. Now, these characters are these slightly prepubescent males. Anybody ever have a 10, 11, 12-year-old boy in the house? You know how they start to get that funny little smell? Mothers who drive their boys, it's not B.O. exactly, but mothers who drive the, the we dri you drive the boys around, little boys at this age, like fifth, sixth grade, around to their soccer games, and you'll get this, it has this funny kind of slightly pungent smell. And that is their glands starting all over their body. They are responding to that, those hormones that are coming out and stimulating their sweat glands. Now, that will be B.O., will be B.O. in about another year or two. <laughs> Anybody know what age is the average age for ma for males to go into puberty? So it's the it's the first wet dream, and it's 13 and a half on average. So half of the boys will go before 13 and a half, and the other half will go after. And so we we measure it by the first first wet dream because that means that the whole reproductive tract has obviously been stimulated enough by all the hormones. Okay, so that's, these boys aren't quite there yet, but they're, who knows what they're looking at at that computer. I remember my son at that age, very quickly the computer would be turned off the minute the moms walked in the room. 
Okay, now I want to talk about uh, some some science, and this is a mini medical school course after all. And this is this slide is going to represent how I got interested in this area. When I was um, at Yale Medical School and I took my first rotation in my third year in psychiatry, I discovered then that um, I really I was really interested in the emotional life of women in particular, and I was very interested that right there at about 12 years old, in childhood, the rate of depression in males and females is about one to one. And then at puberty, it starts to split off and ends up at two to one. This is worldwide in about 165 cultures where it's been looked at. The ratio of depression in women is, a two, is two to one. And you see that greenish line that goes up, that's the female, and the one that stays down there lower, it's the male. Now, Scientists don't know if that's because the testosterone that starts in the male at that age is slightly an antidepressant, and then the cycling hormones in the female make her more um, emotionally sensitive. It is not known still uh, about what it is, but because it starts right at puberty to split like that, um, the thinking is it has something to do with the respective hormones in, in the male and female brain. Okay, so tonight I'm gonna take you through the puberty for girls and how the brain gets triggered to be sensitive because at the end I also want to be able to talk about some aspects of perimenopause and menopause and going on to that end and what happens there. Just so that what you'll be able to hold in your mind is what is happening to you and you, other people that you know, other women that you know, and you'll know something about the whole woman, kind of the biological piece of what may be, and honoring that in yourself. I think we women tend to just try kind of roughshod, run roughshod like, you know, over ourselves and some of our needs. So I want you just to kind of contemplate some of this and how you might take this into your life to improve your health and the health of, of your loved ones. And um, you guys in the audience that are, that want something more about the female brain. There's only one page in the female brain book. It's, I call it the Cliff Notes for Guys. It's page 39, so you can read that one page and, and sort of know where to go with, with the females <laughs> in your life. Okay, so female brain. These uh, are our customers here. <laughs> I also expanded my clinic with a, a nice grant from the uh, Lynn and Mark Benioff um, Foundation to incorporate teen girls in the Mood and Hormone Clinic in 2007. So um, I see lots of teen girls. The, um, the first, one of the first girls that was brought to me was a girl in um, none of these, these this is a, a stock photo. This is, this is nobody that's, uh, that, that is known. They've already signed off on giving this photo away, I guess. But the 13-year-old that I first saw, her teacher brought her to me. And she said, you know, please see this student of mine. Uh, because three weeks of the month, she is getting A's in everything she does. And that, that and one week of the month, she gets F, she just fails. And she said, I think she has, I think she has some kind of PMS because I, she said as a teacher, I had this when I was her age too. So here is this really astute, I think, seventh or eighth grade teacher bringing her student in uh, to talk about what's going on with her hormones and, and why she's having this big change at that, uh, that fourth, fourth week of the period. Okay, so I think this, what I'm gonna put here is something, how, are any of you teachers in grade school or teachers or have been or have people in your family who teach third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade? Because I find when I present this to teachers, it's, this is something that's, that's not so known, but the, the onset of breast development, you know you can see girls and you can see that little tiny breast bud start, you know, they have this little, like kind of little, little bump that starts on their chest. That's called the tanner going, that, that tells you that those little cells, the only way that those breast tissue buds start to form is when estrogen comes from the ovary. So as soon as you see that on a little girl, whatever age she is, you know that estrogen is, is being, that those breaks have been taken off that part of her brain that are letting the pituitary start to pump and, and to command that ovary to start making estrogen. And um, so the onset of breast development, the average age for that is Caucasian girls are about the 10th birthday, about 30% are by age eight. Now remember the brain goes into puberty about two years before the body does. 
So the brain is is getting getting the, the getting kickstarted a bit before the, the body does. So it takes some time for those ovaries to start making that tissue grow. African American girls are by the ninth birthday. There's about 40 percent are about by age eight. So you know eight, nine, ten. Those are third, fourth graders. So it's kind of important to remember that they're, I mean, I was, my, my mother started her period, I think she, when she was around 10, I think I started mine at about the, about 10.5, about right about when I was about 11. So it's, it's also very awkward to be in the early group because no, there's so few girls and the teachers aren't ready for you. And so those are a group that we try to keep track of and to be helpful to these days. So the onset of the menstrual period is called menarche and that's the age when the depression starts to increase in some, in some girls, obviously not all girls. The girl that was brought to me, of course, was, and I go through her whole story in, in chapter two of the female brain, in the, in the teen girl brain part of that book. Caucasian girls are starting their period about 12.6 now. I think it's now actually aiming to go about 12.1 recently because with the obesity epidemic, one of the things that the brain does is it assesses how likely your body would be to carry a pregnancy by, by much, how much body fat you have. So we'll probably be seeing the age of onset of menses go lower and lower. African American girls, 12.1, so they've, they're always about half a year before. Asian girls tend to be a year later, 13.1, 13.6. Uh, and Hispanic girls are right about 12.5, 12.6. So there's a bit of a spread, and we don't we don't really know why. It doesn't. They're trying to attach it to possibly body fat and fat in the diet of different ethnic groups, but nobody has really. The, none of the scientists have really been able to figure out what, why this is. So the onset of what's called uh, breast stage five or Tanner stage five, fully developed breasts in years about 15 and a half for Caucasian girls, 13.9. And for um, African American girls and Asian girls are a little bit later often. So I think it's 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 good to kind of know what the range is because it's you can imagine for a poor teacher in a classroom of fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders, you've got these half of your girls are in puberty, and of course the boys are lagging behind. They're at least 18 months behind, and their brains are still like prepubescent brains. These boys are, and all the girls are already getting all those interesting, incredible dendritic expansion of the brain and the cognitive and abstract abilities that you get at that stage of brain development. And the boys are probably, probably should be at least a grade or two, most of them um, behind. So it's really hard for the teachers to, to, to have this um, organized. So here's about age 7, 10, 13, and adult, about, the, about a 15-fold increase in estrogen. If you are under 6.8 years old and you start your period, you are called precocious puberty. If you're over 6.8 years old, you're not. You're considered in the normal range. So if you're, if you're the 6.8 or younger, um, the endocrinologist will give you medication to, to, stop your, to stop the hormonal cycle so that it waits a little bit longer. One of the problems about going into puberty that early for boys or girls is that it makes you much shorter. Your bones stop growing because the, um, the hormones stop the bone growth. So you'll be very short if you go into puberty um, very, very early. Um, plus, it, you're so out of sync with your peer group at that age. If you're eight years, if you're you know, seven years old and you've started your period, they, I mean, they will let you go as within the normal range now. So at any rate, they usually end up in our psychiatrist's office about five years later after that. Okay, so I think it's important to also remember um, since we're thinking a lot about bullying and social aggression, it's not just boys who are clobbering the heck out of each other on the playground or bullying each other, but the increase in girl type aggression, the rumor mongering, formation of cliques, purposeful exclusion of girls, and manipulation. Now there's all this really unbelievable depth of that on the Facebook and the Twitter and the blah. And I just got um, asked to, to work with the, the group up in Vancouver where the 14-year-old girl who had been bullied quite a bit ended up committing suicide. She hung herself and her mother came in and found her after being bullied terribly on Facebook. Um, and that's, you know, you hear about these in the media, sadly. Um, so it's, it's a time where teachers, aunts, all of us that, you know, have teen girls in our life, especially if you're not the mother, because 
the teen girls don't like to sp speak to their mother in particular, but if you have a friend or a neighbor who's a teen girl, you know, if there's what you can do that's helpful sometimes is to see if you might not be able to just strike up some kind of little friendly exchange with them because you may be the one that they're able to come to. Okay, this is a so the other issue that I wanted to talk about in the in teen girls is that happens, of course, that Mari was talking about is okay. Now you're supposed to look good at all times. You're supposed to be really thin. You're supposed to be really pretty. You're supposed to do all the, you know, the makeup. Is, now, and I've often been asked by the media, well, isn't this the fault of the media? They have all these, you know, these magazines with the skinny girls on. Well, the, the reality is, think about it, is that girls that are 9, 10, 11 in all cultures, in the cultures in Africa where they do the, the scars on their face, the scarification, as a beauty mark, or stretch their neck, or stretch their ears or their lip, or wear, you know, do all kinds of things that, that are particular to women and beauty in their culture. The girls can't wait to do this, whatever it is. Um, and to be beautiful is a way of doing what females are supposed to do. We're supposed to attract those males who are out there seeking out females. Um, and because we have the strange occurrence in our modern days to be having fertile females who used to have babies at 15, 16, 17, not doing that for another decade later, we have kind of an odd social problem in, in, in all cultures. So I don't think, you know, you don't want your daughters going out on the street looking like something you wouldn't, that's always been a thing. I remember we used to, in my day, that was the day of the mini skirt, and they used to measure. They made, they made you kneel on the floor in your schools, and they would measure from the ground to, the, to your skirt to see if it was more than two inches or whatever it was that particular year. And then we would get up, we'd go in the bathroom, we'd roll the top of the skirt up, right? We'd roll up, and we'd go out there, and they, they, we'd just been measured, right? So we didn't do it. But so, you know, every, every, every generation has their thing. And, I don't want to leave you guys out because guys have a whole lot of stuff with body image too during their puberty and you know they their body we go into this thing about breast size and you know we get all obsessed but all the studies that have been done on guys too teen boys are all like they're 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 quietly very nervous about their body parts too so so we have to kind of cut them a little slack here too these boys from the age of 9 years old to 15 are having a 25-fold increase in testosterone. When I was doing the research to write the male brain, I it sort of knocked my socks off that. For I think that's an important thing for women to know is that this is like this is a major sea change. The way they see the world, and there have been lots of brain studies on on teen boys, and actually they show them pictures of faces, and the boys will distort a neutral face into an aggressive face by the time they're about 14 or 15 years old. They, they're doing a lot of rewiring of their brain to make sense of their new world, so it's quite interesting. Um, we're not talking about the male brain tonight, but that, it's an interesting place in there in the teen boy brain for a few years until he sort of sorts out his world, too. So. All right, now this, this will be a setup, I guess, for your later talk from um, another doctor on sleep. But one thing that's, that's interesting to know is that you can see down there at about 10 years old, um, kids go to sleep pretty early and they'll wake up early. Ch in childhood, you kind of do that along with the circadian rhythm in a certain way. And one of the ways that you can actually find that your kid is shifting into this teen stage is that you start going to bed later and later and later and waking up later and later and later. And there's, it's basically part of brain development at that stage. Growth hormone and um, testosterone and estrogen are being squirted out in massive quantities during sleep at night. So if you want to really give your kid an IQ and a performance boost in school, let them sleep. The fact, the fact that kids really shouldn't be up in a classroom until it at the, the earliest 10 a.m. because of this sh shift is really nuts for our schools. That school, some schools have actually tried to work with this and shift it, but it becomes the coaching staff for sports teams are the ones who nix it all the time because they don't get access to the kids that they want at that time in the morning. So the other thing that you might notice from here is the blue line 
which is the male, and the red line below is the female, that there's this split. The boys are going to bed later and later and waking up later and later, and the girls aren't quite at that point. And actually, you see age 50, we finally come back to being on a similar circadian sleep-wake cycle at about age 50. So there is hope, ladies. <laughs> it's hope. <laughs> <laughs> for that, but it's just, uh, it's, it's quite, quite interesting, and there's nothing particular to be made of this, just to kind of have that as your knowledge, and think parents having that as our knowledge, that the kids, are, the, the teenagers' brains are massively shifting and need this. So let's take a look a little deeper into the estrogen and progesterone and testosterone changes in the female. I'm going to get, show you one graph, but um, I want to talk just briefly, emotional tuning of the female brain. When a woman comes to me, I do a 90-minute interview, and we start. I start on a timeline for that woman. I want to know the whole woman as best I can. I want to integrate, you know, all the parts of her, what, all of the things that have been emotionally meaningful, all the high points in her life, the low points in her life. So I always start on a on a, a, a life timeline with her at point zero, and I ask her first, do you know anything about your mother's pregnancy with you? And the reason I find that really helpful is um, because we all have little stories we've been told about that off often. Um, and I ask, were you a full-term baby? So it helps me know from the get-go kind of the biology that you've had. Were you, were you a preemie? Which means that there are all kinds of different things and ways in which you were wired for greater or lesser responsivity to stress and how resilient you're going to be. Um, you know, so I, I like to know all of those things, starting with your mother's pregnancy with you and then moving forward. And how you got emotionally tuned is really important. I like to ask, were you, were you a healthy infant? Did you have any hospitalizations? Um, what child number were you? It helps me put, put you as an individual in the landscape of the context of the, of the environment you grew up in. And that, that certainly matters a lot. If a kid has had a lot of uh, trips to the hospital for whatever, for asthma, whatever it was, and I, then I ask, what age did you go to school? Did you enjoy school? And there's all kinds of different answers to that. There's no right or wrong answer. But if I find a kid that, you know, we have something called kind of a genetic anxiety disorder. And if you were the type of person who was so shy that you grabbed onto your mother's skirts and did not want to go, um, one of the things it could mean is that you have wiring for um, social anxiety from the get-go. And that's how you're wired, and we can work with it. We have all kinds of tools to work with it, but it kind of helps me know the whole complete woman, you know. Whereas if you were that kind of bold little girl who just like, you know, bossed everybody around like I was, and you just walked into that classroom, and you, you know, that's, you know, you have other problems <laughs> that your poor mother has to deal with, you know. <laughs> And then I always ask the question about what, um, what age were you when you started your period, and who helped you with that? And you'll be surprised. I mean, you know, the, the, the answer that most of us, the, the average woman gives is, my mother helped me. You'd be surprised at how many women say, oh, I, had, I just did it myself, or um, my older sister helped, or there's all kinds, there's no right or wrong answer, but it's like, you know, it's like a little dipstick into that person's life and their relationship often with their mother is, is really becomes clear to you as the person asking the question. It helps you understand how stressful someone's teen years were, and et cetera, et cetera, and if they've had any. So the emotional tuning of the female brain. Also, the social expectations of females for taking care of others physically and emotionally which leads to a lot of expectations of ourselves and a shutting down of our own expression of our needs, or at least a curtailing of them. And it doesn't just happen in females, by the way. It's interesting having, a, having I have a son who's very emotionally sensitive to his girlfriends. And I'm having to try, he's on girlfriend number two now. And he never, he takes care of them. He's the caretaker. And then if he has a need for something, that something bad went in his life, he, he needs to talk. He doesn't do it. He just feels that that's, he, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to encourage him to talk about his needs. So it's not just for females. All of us need to be 
having expectations that we'll be heard as well as we're gonna take care of others. So versus the hormonal and biological tuning of the female brain, and then you know the mental and physical self-care that we need to take responsibility for for ourselves, and the deficits that we sometimes end up with. So I, I give you that kind of context in what I'm gonna say for the rest of the time, um, and uh, fitting in with the theme of the mini medical school this year. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you about this, this study done by uh, my colleague in Switzerland, Tania Singer, uh, which was published in Science Magazine in 2004 because it was quite interesting. Uh, some of you are smiling because some of you may know this study, but um, the, uh, these are the brains of um, the person feeling the pain was the partner to the person sitting outside the brain scanner listening to the person, they get little shocks and so they, they, you, it's not like pain where you're gonna be blood curdling screams and pain, but you get a certain level of a shock to your, to your partner or your beloved that's in the scanner and you're sitting in the room and you're, you're the, you, and they didn't, they did fe males in the scanner and females in the room. They tried to do it the other way, but they couldn't get the males sitting outside the scanner to react quite like this. So <laughs> go figure that. I don't know, hopefully they'll, <laughs> they've tried it a bunch of times and it doesn't quite work. So at any rate, <clears throat> the person feeling the pain, this is where their brain is lighting up, and the person listening to their beloved feel, hear, hear, just hearing him feel the pain, she lights up in a very similar area to where, this, to where he's feeling the pain. And we have these things called mirror neurons. They're kind of spread out all over our brain. They're not in kind of a certain area. But it, it is, and females tend, seem to have more of them and they're more active. It's like when I'm looking at your face and if you're really upset about something, even though you may not be crying or anything else, I can look, I will just put my facial muscles in the exact same mirror image of yours. And the fact that my facial muscles are doing what yours is triggers my brain to tell me what you're probably, what you're pr probably feeling. So we do that, we females do it visually much better than males on average, and auditorily we do it better, which makes sense because females actually have been shown to hear, hear infants cry a lot better than males. Interesting though, Male brain, after a guy becomes a dad, his ability to hear other infants, not even on his own, actually increases tremendously. So their, their brains are trainable, ladies. So. <laughs> but this is called the empathy system, and you'll hear that autistic people who have autism or Asperger's syndrome have something wrong with the development of that system. But Females have this a lot, and this is called the empathy system, and that's all from uh, Tania Singer's work, and she's gone on to do much more on that. But I, I, I okay, let's go back for a second. <laughs> so I wanna go into kind of talking about how our brains are like, getting tuned here. So or someone faxed me, someone faxed me, a former boyfriend actually faxed me this, so I should be offended by it, but this was many years ago. It says, I have PMS and a handgun, any questions? <laughs> Um, so the mood changes across the menstrual cycle. Now let's, this, we have four weeks of the menstrual cycle and we count day one of bleeding as the first day of the menstrual cycle. So actually most women are having their period during week one. So week one is usually kind of the week of bleeding. So the week four is that part of the, the month that we often have the worst mood the best mood is usually right before ovulation. And we don't know why this has been shown over and over in study after study after study about mood. We don't quite know why that is. 80% of women will say that they, that they notice this at some point. In my clinic, we call it the crying over dog food commercials <laughs> sign. That at the worst, you know, at that day, a day before you start your period, little things that wouldn't ordinarily trigger you to feel, you know, tearful or empathic with somebody are, are, are much higher tuned. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of the reasons why we think that is. But if you think of your female brain and female body as something that's kind of being played during all your fertile years by, these, by our hormones to some extent, about 20% of women, by the way, don't get hardly any of this or notice very much of this. So it's about one out of five who don't, but four out of five who do. Um, and only about one out of five need to come to see me because it's 
four or five days a month they are not able to go to work, they're home crying, they're, you know, they really are severely affected by it. Okay, these big lovely estrogen slash E2 bump there in the, in the top is the ovary squirting out all this estrogen. And when that estrogen goes up to that bump, you know what it does is it triggers back to the pituitary to tell the pituitary to give something called an LH surge and it makes your ovary pop out that egg to go down the fallopian tube. Anybody ever go through or know much about the whole infertility world or how you measure which, when your ovulation is, when your LH surge is? This is the way to get pregnant, ladies, is at the top of that peak of estrogen, you should have sex two or three times a day for two days and you will get pregnant. If you, if you are fertile. So that's how we kind of teach couples who are, at least we, at least we get that vibe. There's nothing else, if there's nothing else wrong, that should do it because that's when the egg is going to be released. Now, ovulation happens at the end of the second week. And that first two weeks is called the follicular phase because the little follicle is making the ovary develop. And then it pops out. And the luteal phase is when that progesterone dotted heap comes up. Now, progesterone actually is used in anesthesia to put people to sleep. It's part of the mixture of compounds that makes you really sleepy at, at higher levels. And I don't know about anybody, in, how many of you have ever been pregnant in the room? Yeah, I can remember the one thing. Did you remember that feeling? I mean, at about eight weeks pregnant, your progesterone level goes up to about 100,000, 150,000 from the level of 20. And I felt like I was like, in the Wizard of Oz, remember they're walking through the poppies and they just <laughs> drop and fall asleep. I was really embarrassed because I was at my mother-in-law's house and I was supposed to be helping with the dishes and I just couldn't keep my eyes open. I had to get up and go sleep. It was like the most sedating. It was the best sleeping pill I ever had, except you wanted to sleep all day. The progesterone is a great, great sleeper. And sleep does go up. It's easier to sleep often in week three or three, a little bit into four. But you see, do you, do you see how it goes? That dotted line goes crashing down there at the bottom? Okay. So. Your good things that are different are your extra verbal right before your ovulation. And women have been, been measured to do all kinds of, we do we all kinds of things we don't know about. We put on sexier clothes then. We put on a little bit more makeup. We are a little bit sassier, we're a little more verbal. Right before, Mother Nature must have made this this way because it's, you know, it's like, come here, any spare sperm out there? <laughs> You know, so that's that's kind of like it's all wired into us. There we go, and then of course, sex, it's libido with that little testosterone hill, the black hill. That the highest testosterone is right before ovulation. That's how I say that's how Mother Nature made it, so you'll get pregnant. And then of course, uh oh, at the end, by the time it's all over anyway, by that time you're not going to get pregnant. It's, you've, you've missed you've missed the boat by the time you get there anyway. So Mother Nature doesn't care about you at that point. You're just like you're done for another month. But PMS comes when that hill starts to go down rapidly. The cool thing to remember is that progesterone hits the same same receptors in the brain that Valium hits. So when it's around, you feel pretty nice and mellow, but when it starts to bottom out, it's like a rug gets pulled out from underneath the brain, and you get irritable and crabby. And, and I don't know if anybody ever has been on Valium for a couple of days or Ativan or any of those medicines, and you stop taking them or Xanax, and then you're off of them, and, and, and you feel like you, you're, you're, you're irritable, you're crabby, you're tearful, you're all the things that you are. You're really PMSing, actually. Okay. So this is all, that's all you need to know about what's kind of happening for fertile age women from age, whatever, 13 to 51. Hello, hormones, right? <laughs> um, and this goes back to the kind of risk for depression and irritability and moodiness, because of course in pregnancy, postpartum, and the perimenopause, we're gonna go into a little bit of that and how that, in perimenopause, so for some reason, you get a 13-fold increase in depression for a couple of years of just absolute moodiness that didn't come, and even for a lot of women who've never had a depression or anxiety moment very much in their life for some reason, so. Okay, first up, pregnancy. So I just wanted to let you guys know that for men, you know, if they're sleeping next to a pregnant woman, we have now know that pheromones, anybody know what a pheromone is? It's an airborne hormone, and it wafts over into the nostrils of the sleeping male and actually changes things in his brain, and his brain circuits. One of the things it does is it suppresses testosterone by about 30%. 
And this hormone called prolactin in the male brain goes up by about 33%. Prolactin, we don't know what it's doing in the male. It means prolactation. It means making milk in the female. It's, it's the hormone that we need to make milk. OK. There's what I was telling you about, about the hormone levels during pregnancy. You see down there that little tiny menstrual section? That's, that's about the relative size of hormone levels up and down, up and down during the menstrual cycle. And in pregnancy, look how high the progesterone goes up there, 150, 170,000 from being at 30. So you really are being sedated. I say, you know, actually, the, th the fetus has already taken over the female brain. <laughs> You're no longer in charge. <laughs> um, but look at that backside down. What do you think's happened to all those receptors, or those Valium receptors in the brain? They, they may not be too happy. So that is where the postpartum piece comes in. Because when you deliver the placenta and the baby, you are taken from a level that's that high to boom. Like with immediately, you are like in no man's land for a few days. And eight days after giving birth is something we call baby blues. Anybody ever hear baby blues? Crying, boo-hoo, why did I ever think I wanted a baby? Oh, gosh. What, and everybody's expecting you. Talk about social expectations. This is the worst. Everybody's expecting you to be like, oh, the baby, the baby, the whatever. And women, for a couple of days, four out of five women, for a couple of days, they feel crabby, irritable, tearful, like, the, you know. But somehow, four out of five women goes click right back onto their own hormone system within about two or three weeks. One out of five don't. And one out of five women have some version of postpartum depression when the hormones crash. So that's, what they, that's when they end up in my clinic. Um, this is a graph looking at 54,087 births in a 12-year period. Of course, this was not done in this country. Our healthcare system couldn't uh, produce this data. This was done in Great Britain. And there, there's the pregnancy, childbirth, and these are postpartum depressions that were so severe they required hospitalization. And you can see how they really do occur right there in the, about the four to six month <coughs> period around giving birth. So if you're gonna get it, you're probably gonna get it within four months although we say 12, the first 12 months, uh, about 10% of women get some kind of postpartum depression that they could certainly use some help with. Um, up until our modern era, there was lots of, there was lots of uh, women who died, babies who died. Uh, we had, and we had to have some ability. Mother Nature had to have two adults. And so the daddy brain, I think, gets formed so that, boom, baby's born. Guys are pretty ready to start um, taking on the role of the mom, the parent. You know, they're ready to take over. And um, many, many dads can and are ready and do. <laughs> this is the biggest de-stressor, women. This is, the, this is the man of the future. <laughs> Those lucky women in Copenhagen already have him. <laughs> and that great vacuum cleaner and that great little whatever. <laughs> OK, so having a husband who is not um, very attuned to the mother who's just given birth, uh, or there's a lot of stress, a marital stress, is one of the biggest um, times that you end up having postpartum depressions that are very difficult to treat. So, now this little slide, the fertile woman, here she is, here's her ovary pumping out the estrogen and the progesterone, and down here, this is with the brain, the pituitary is giving your LH and FSH. And then in perimenopause, I like to call it the sputtering ovary syndrome. It's very erratic estrogen. Some, some months you'll get way too much pituitary hormone, and then the estrogen will go up and down. This is the, I hate this slide because it makes you look like you're flatlined after menopause. <laughs> and I am here to tell you that that is not the truth. <laughs> if the, I tell women with PMS, the good news, ladies, is menopause is coming. <laughs> so. Um, this, the perimenopause lasts for two to nine years. Sometimes when I ask audiences how long does it last, women always say it lasts too long. <laughs> um, the early stages are usually not so problematic. About 50% of women will complain to their doctor about their mood during this period, even if they don't have hot flashes. So it can be, uh, and what do we know that really can help this? 
we'll ask Margaret Chesney because because it's exercise that can really really help if you're having a lot without medication we find that that within 90 days of putting a woman on a regular 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 I tell my women that don't have they've been couch potatoes often whatever 25 minutes a day I don't care what you call exercise what you call movement just I want you to promise that for 365 days seven days a week you will do 25 minutes of something and usually within about 90 days they are in there they I mean well, you need more than that but it's at least a way to get people started and it, it helps the perimenopause a lot it ends at about age 51 to 55 the average age of men is menopause is 51.5 so half of women go through it before 51 and a half half of women go afterwards and they did a longitudinal study and found that the increased risk of depression close to menopause, you see that big black line there at the last menstrual period. So right, this is the years before the last menstrual period, five years before, four years, three years. So something right there in the last 24 months before the last menstrual period is the time that women feel like, God, this is what they tell them, this is, what, this is the typical, like, God, if I have to feel like this for the rest of my life, I'm not sure I want to go on. These are from women sometimes have never been depressed in their life. They have no intention of killing themselves, but they feel that bad. They feel like it's just, so if any of you or your friends, your family get into that, we, we have lots of tools in our toolbox to fix this. So <laughs> exercise is not the only thing. We start with that. Okay, so here's where we, how we do the assessment. There's two criteria for screening. A shortening of the cycle, which I like to call the sputtering ovary syndrome. So that beautiful, I mean, how many of you were very, very regular with your period in your 20s and 30s? I mean, some women are like within six hours every month, like clockwork. Um, and the, that just tells you how tightly choreographed, how beautifully choreographed the pituitary, the brain and the ovaries are just so tightly, you know, tuned. And then as it starts to, the communication starts to fail a little bit in the early 40s and mid 40s, and the ovary may not do what the pituitary is telling it to do, and the pituitary starts screaming louder and louder and louder, and that's why your FSH goes up, 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 up. As you go through perimenopause and menopause, it's the pituitary is screaming at the ovary to make more estrogen, but the estrogen, the ovary has retired already. Thank you very much, but. <laughs> that menstrual cycle shortening tells you that you're in the perimenopause. So if you were always a 28-day person or a 30-day person, and you end up going from 30 days down to, say, 29 or 28, even a day says that that choreography is sort of getting a little bit less tight. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's totally normal. That's just how it happens. And then a depressed or irritable mood. So that's the perimenopausal depression that we talk about. Many women have never been um, depressed in their life. And then there's no lab tests for the perimenopause, sadly, yet. You know, a lot of um, your OBGYNs will measure your FSH or your LH, which is, are the hormones that start to go higher and higher and higher as the, as the menopause starts to get closer and closer. Or in infertility clinics, if you have an FSH over 20, then they, it's considered that you may not be able to use your own eggs if you want to get pregnant. You'll have to use gift eggs or use your own frozen eggs um, if you've had the luck to freeze them earlier, which is I rec we're recommending that to our medical students uh, in their mid-20s that if they wait past 35 to identify their sperm donor, they should start thinking about freezing their eggs if they want to use them later. So anyway, that's kind of, you've seen that in the New York Times this last couple of weeks a lot. That's what's, that's what's going on in that particular field. Okay, so here we are, a little review of how the menses starts to have that two to one ratio of depression split. Perimenopause, you get way up there into like a 13 fold increase before the menopause. And the good news is after menopause, if a woman is healthy, she's exercising, has a good diet, sometimes she's got better mood than she's got had in her whole life. So the good news is that um, there's something to look forward to. All right. Um, Switching gears a little bit here, it says, just before sex, what's on his mind? <laughs> and then what's on hers? That little tiny corner says sex up there on the top on hers. Birth control, my cellulite, that pint of Ben and Jerry's in the fridge. 
a long discussion about our relationship, keeping my feet warm. I, I always tell my husband he's my main foot warmer, you know. <laughs> you know you're in trouble when he's, he, that's his main job. <laughs> he says, I was not planning on that being my main job. <laughs> okay. After sex, it's... <laughs> Rolling, rolling over and going to sleep, a lo avoiding a long discussion about our relationship, catching the second half of the game, and right down this is peeing, right there, oh, oh, brown. her orgasm, fake or real, right? her cellulite, whatever, and yeah, okay. So I think they should have a little visit to the sex therapist, yes, and kind of, kind of get on the same page. But anyway, with that said, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about sexual function because I think that one of the things that always goes for women who are really busy is that sex doesn't end up being on the top of the list for a lot of women. You know, you've got eight other things up there and sex may not raise, especially you've got a couple of kids, you've got the school lunches, you've got whatever. So um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the biology behind the, the how we think about this in some women and, and what happens for some women. The, Testosterone levels in males, I guess the, the thing didn't show up there, but the top, this is the male at about, males run about age 19 to 26, they run a level of about 600 to 1,000. I measured, I was doing a study on um, testosterone in my department at one point about 15 years ago on DHEA and testosterone, so I measured all of the men's testosterone in our department. <laughs> that was an interesting experience. <laughs> The guy that I was, this my partner in doing the study, turned out to be the lowest in the department. And this other guy who was like, who's now a really famous scientist, probably will win the Nobel Prize some, someday, uh, now runs a whole division of uh, the science department down at Stanford. So it's interesting to watch them kind of sort themselves out. At any rate, uh, we women are in that little yellow bag. We have, we have a smaller amount, but we get a lot of bang for our buck. So. We need to have some. You can't have none, because for females, it is testosterone that runs our libido. It has that same, remember I told you that area for sexual pursuit and the area for sex drive in the brain is 2.5 times larger in the male, but we still have ours, and we uh, need our testosterone to run it. And when we have it, we do just fine. Thank you very much. Um, so, just keeping that in mind that we need to have some. So I wanted to look at the, these. this was a study done, done um, back in, I think it was 1999, but they, were look, they looked at about 20,000 people. And this was not one of these things, it was a, not a clinic study, not people who came to the clinic. These were, this was like, a, this was, I guess it must have been organized kind of like a political campaign, because people went door to door and asked people these questions, et cetera. <laughs> and here's how the data came out with sexual complaints in women. All right, age 25 to 45, the lack of sexual desire was a complaint of 25 to 33 percent. So up to a third of women were complaining of low desire, and in that young, in that fertile age group, problems with orgasm, 25 to 30 percent, and that was either slow orgasm or um, no orgasm. Um, lack of arousal was 25 to 45%. And then in the age 45 to 65, up to half had a lack of desire. And the, the problems with orgasm seemed to stay about the same. And lack of arousal was a little bit more in the older women. So that, this is a population study of just um, going and knocking on people's doors and asking them these questions. Males did not have anything near this. They were like, you know, ten, in the 10%. The lack of arousal, maybe about 10% of men complain about that, and et cetera. So, all right. This is uh, the sexual desire question in men. I think about sex more than twice a day. 85% of men in that 20 to 30 age group, and 40 to 60, about 68%. And then 60 to 80, you know, uh, a, a fairly a good number there. So, um, you know, ladies, when you think that that's all that's on his mind, <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> so, at any rate, kind of look at this contrast a bit, and I'm going to give you a case because we, I've, I'm, I end up at this university for some reason being the person who does most of these assessments in women, and I think it's because I do above the neck 
you know, and my OBGYN friends do below the waist. And so we kind of have this body divided. It, it's not it's not the integrated medicine, Margaret. It's we we're you know, we're on the geography of the different parts of the body. So um, this this woman is um, some of the, the details have been changed so that you can't guess who she is and she can't guess who she is. Judy is a 53 year old administrator and she has the S slash P is a medical terminology for status post status post um, a hysterectomy a total hysterectomy and ovaries were also removed bilateral cell they had both ovaries removed and two years ago now she has no sexual arousal or pleasure and she is decreasing or absent libido. Her husband has demanded that she get her hormones checked. <laughs> no masturbation or interest in using her vibrator over, for over a year. And to me, that's the most important bioassay in this. And she can't remember the last time she had any sexual interest, which used to be substantial in her 30s. OK. So here's a workup for her low libido. If you have a new onset lack of sexual desire, she, of course, had her ovaries removed. And um, you measure the person's hormones, particularly the free testosterone. You find out what medications they're on, if they're taking oral estrogens, if an SSRI is the category of medicines that Prozac is in. The, all of those drugs for antidepressants cause um, low libido, or at least ca and cause anorgasmia or slow orgasm in both males and females. Uh, and assess the anger at your partner, because 80% of sexual dysfunction between couples is anger at partner. Masturbation, you, in, or you have to find out what their masturbatory history is and what their current masturbation is and what they're interested in. Because a woman, if you just ask her how, much, how many times a week she has intercourse, you may, you're not necessarily measuring her sexual interest. You're measuring often the male's sexual interest. So you have to ask about masturbation because that's her own interest. Uh, and previous sexual function and any sexual abuse history. So we do all of those things. So what happened with this lady? Well, um, Judy had, you know, your ovaries make 25% of your, of your testosterone, and your adrenal glands make about 75%. But when your ovaries are out, that puts all the burden on the adrenal glands. And if you're under a lot of stress, you often have burned out adrenal glands, and it's not making as much testosterone as it, as it should. So she had a bunch of reasons. She had some of her, she had her ovaries out, and she was actually under a lot of stress. And had to look at the binding hormones for the liver, because there's these big globby proteins that the liver makes sometimes. When you take other medicines, like you're starting to, you're taking oral estrogen, it makes the liver make these globby hormones that go around and grab onto all your testosterone. And then it's not free testosterone anymore, it's bound testosterone, and you might as well have zero testosterone. OK, so what we did for Judy, we gave her estrogen and testosterone. And we had the couple kind of get an education type of basically mostly to kind of help them ease back. Once you've fallen off the horse, it takes a little bit of encouragement and coaching to get back up on the horse, so to speak, and so help them along with that process. So we got our testosterone back up. And within about um, two and a half months, they didn't need to see us anymore. OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with saying that the mature male and female brain can now have a conversation by about age 60. We're kind of, you know, the males have gone. The mature male brain, I'm going to give you one piece of good of hope, ladies, and here's the hope. At age 60, between age 60 and 80, his testosterone goes down to about the same level that ours will be <laughs> from our adrenal glands. So in, in your um, postmenopausal years, males and females end up having sometimes a more matching sex drive than they've ever had in their life before. So males will lose 2 to 3% of their testosterone per year after the age of 30. And by the time they're 80, they'll only have about 5% of what they had when they're 19 or 20. So um, they, they don't fall off a cliff like stopping their period like the, the females, like we females do. Theirs goes down much, much more gradually. So I only have one piece of information for you guys that I wish you to have. My top hormone advice is the best the hormone is oxytocin. Oxytocin, not oxycontin, but oxytocin. <laughs> is the hormone that's released when you give a person a hug or a massage. Um, and it's also the hormone, by the way, that, that squeezes the baby out 
of the uterus. So it has lots of, it's, it's called, so called the mater, maternal hormone. So you can get more massage, you can have more cuddles. Uh, re, re, having lots of oxytocin hormone reduces people's blood pressure by 20 or 30 points they've measured in lots of studies. So I encourage you to hold hands and walk on the beach and cuddle up. And that's kind of one of the best, the best uh, stress reducers that we know for the, for the total person. And spending a lot of nice time with good friends uh, is probably the best of anything for your health. So thank you very much, and thank you to the staff here at the Mini Medical School. I think I may have time for a couple of questions. Is that true? Okay. So the question is, during the menopause, is there any carryover after you go stop your last period of having a monthly cycle? that's um, sort of running under the radar, if you will, and you're not having a monthly bleeding. And yes, that ha does, does happen in, in, in subtle ways sometimes for a few year, up to a few years afterwards. Uh, I've, you know, I've had some women come to my clinic and, then, and really um, we've had to modify some things we're doing to kind of account for that. Um, there's no research that's been done on that, so the, the real data is out. So any of you that want a research career and looking into the <laughs> postmenopausal a female, it it does sort of it it doesn't build up enough blood in the uterus to actually bleed or have a period, but it does have some some cycling that still goes on. So thank you for that question. Yes, down here. It's about oxytocin, and um, yes, females and males release a lot of oxytocin during orgasm. Um, both males and females, and um, they noticed that actually the oxytocin helps to squeeze out the sperm because it, it's kind of a hormone that makes things squeeze. So it's the one that causes the orgasm to your, you know, you to squeeze. But the, the males are actually actually squeezing out the sperm with some oxytocin. So I guess having more sex will make you less depressed. Maybe you know that's what some people. <laughs> yeah, that's what some people. Uh, and so um, you know, de definitely oxytocin is a hormone that's called a neuropeptide, and it's being looked into much more in terms of what it's doing. It's been tried to use it some in um, in autism and Asperger's to help stimulate the eye-to-eye -eye contact and more affiliation. So it's, being, it's been an interesting hormone. So keep your eye on the, the oxytocin, not oxycontin uh, hormone. It could be very helpful. The lady in the lovely curly red hair, yes. So Rebecca asked a question about um, how you can get different types of brain based on the hormones that bathe it during your um, development in utero. The fetus does uh, respond to testosterone and there are, and I talk um, some more about this in female brain, there's a syndrome called congenital adrenal hyperplasia that both boys and girls have in utero and it, te it pumps out androgens from the adrenal glands. And so the female brains from those with the, the syndrome called CAH get their brain bathed in testosterone. And so actually those girls end up having more rough and tumble play. They um, end up having all kinds of behaviors that are a bit more male-like. And about actually half of them grow up to be same sex attracted, half will grow up to be opposite sex attracted. So it doesn't have anything to do with their fertility, it just has to do with which sex they're attracted to. And by the way, probably we, there's been so much work done on the gay brain and what it is that causes the gay brain. It doesn't, is it hormones? Is it genes? Is it, you know, we really don't know. I think there's been an interesting study in Sweden that came out a couple of years ago where they scanned brains of gay males and straight males while they were um, smelling the, the pheromones from females. Uh, from fertile females, and the uh, the straight males' brains lit up in a very excited way when they smelled that, and um, the uh, gay male brains found it very distasteful. And then they gave them the kind of some of the pheromones from male sweat glands to the straight males, and they didn't like it at all. Whereas the the uh, same sex gay male brains really liked it a lot. So there's, we know there's some biological parts of it that we're starting to tease out, but there's, that's sort of very flimsy from a scientific point of view. So it's not some moral decision you make at, at puberty. It's something that unfolds in the natural way that um, teenagers become either same sex or opposite sex attracted during their, their years of puberty. 
her question is about, Jean's question is about hormone replacement therapy and the, the common, how, how we're thinking about that these days. Should she have it? How long should she have it? Can she have it? Can't she have it? If you have a familial genetic breast cancer in your family or a personal history of breast cancer, you can't take the steroid hormones, not, you can't take any estrogen. But if you're not in that category, um, the thinking is, is right after, during the early menopause for hot flashes and that kind of thing, you can take whatever amount you need to control your hot flashes. Um, the, in Europe, for the last 10 years, they've had specific female-sized doses of, of testosterone for replacement, for women's testosterone as they get older or as they, after they have hysterectomies. Um, the FDA has twice not approved it here in this country for women, and during the Bush administration, they just unfortunately disbanded the whole women's sexual health part of the FDA, and that is not re, uh, regrouped, uh, I think, until last year, so hopefully they will, they will move along and let us catch up with our sisters in Europe <laughs> in that regard. So thank you for that question. So the question is about the student that came in, and in the book, I, I call her Shana in the book, um, and she um, basically got very irritable, very moody during that period. So what we do is we put women now on continuous um, birth control pill to kind of like keep the cycle every day to be on the same hormones, um, and that usually smooths that out. Sometimes it does not, and the person, we just, just I showed you how that, big dip in progesterone happens at the end. One of the other ways you can keep that from causing the brain to really get rattled is the medicines in the category of SSRIs like Celexa, Zoloft, Prozac, Lexapro, all of those, and small amounts actually can change the degradation of progesterone and, and keep people from getting so irritable at the end of the cycle. So we have all kinds of little tools in our toolbox to, to use for that, but that's what we did for her, and she ended up um, uh, really doing a lot better, not having that horrible, horrible week. Unfortunately, she only had a dad. She didn't have a mom, so that's the other reason that the teacher probably brought her in, which I was grateful that she did. Well, thank you. You've been such a fabulous audience. and. Um, <laughs>